we'll begin in prayer, okay? Father, Jesus, the Lord, I just want to thank you for this morning, Father, just for getting us, Lord, Father. Thank you again, Lord. I ask you, Father, to uh, uh, help us this morning, Father, to get fed and just uh, to see you, to see you work, Father, Lord. I ask you, Father, to take care of my brother, uh, my pastor, as he sings the word this morning, Father. I ask you, Father, please uh, use him this morning, Father, Lord. Use us all, Father. Let the body just rejoice, Father. Help us, Lord, knit together here this morning, Father. Let us come out here with a full cup, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, never alone. You may stand up, please. Never alone. Amen, amen, amen. my phone before somebody yep okay here we go I've seen the light flashing I heard the thunder roar I felt the sin of prayer to conquer my soul. I've heard the voice of my Savior. He bid me still. Amen. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. What a promise, what a promise. The world of trials are blowing, temptation sharp in me. I have a peace knowing my Savior stand. Yes, thank you, Jesus. promise never to leave me, never to leave me alone. What a promise. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. to leave me, never to leave me alone. When in affliction valley I tread the road of care, my Savior helps me carry so cross. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. To all around me his darkness and earthly joy my Savior with the promise never to leave me alone. Amen. Never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. 
promise never to leave me, never to leave me alone, no, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone, no, never alone. On the third, go on the third. He promised never to leave me. Here we go, here we go. When in the fiction valley after the road of care, my Savior helped me carry. My Savior whisper his promise never to leave me alone, no, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone, no, never alone. to leave me alone. Amen. Though all around me is darkness. It's darkness all around, brothers and sisters. It's darkness. It's darkness, but he's the light. He gets us right through this. I'm tired of looking on TV. I'm tired of all that stuff. It's driving me crazy. Sometimes I sit, I'm like, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. I got to get out. I got to get into the book. Oh, I got to work. I got to do something just to keep away from that darkness. There's a darkness out there. There's a spirit out there, man. It's all around the world. And here we are. What's going on all around the world? God is right here. He's right here, man. He doesn't care. I mean, he's got his plan, but he's right here. Praise the Lord. He lives inside of me. Praise the Lord. Whoa. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, heaven came down. Ready? Amen, amen, amen. Let's go. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I wander in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender compassion of friend. He met the need of my heart. spirit with life from above into God's family divine justified fully through Calvary love oh what a thing in mind and the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came to call an offer of grace he did for he saved me Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross my Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled. Remember that day? Remember that day? Amen, amen. I have hope that will surely adore 
after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure. There in those mansions of mine. And it's because of the wonderful day when at the cross I believe riches eternal and blessings supernal from Amen. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross my Savior made me whole, my sins are washed away. Let's go on number three again. Number three again. Amen, amen. Heaven came down in glory. Here we go. Now I have hope that will surely adore. After the passing of time, I have a future in heaven for sure. That of the mansions is mine. And it's because of the wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Riches eternal and blessings supernal. Amen, amen. Heaven came down in glory. My soul, when at the cross my Savior made me whole, my sins are washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down in glory. Here we go. Heaven came down. Glory. So, amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, those songs bring you memories, doesn't it? They bring you back. It brings me my mother-in-law, I tell you. I used to come to work, and I think for about two, three weeks, that song was in my head, and I was like humming it, and then suddenly she picked it up. She picked it up, and she starts saying, what's that song? So we sang it to her, and that was her favorite song, and she always loved that. She's like, da 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 so, you know, as I'm singing, I'm thinking about Rita. You know, it's like, you know, songs bring you back to certain things, you know, in life. Anyway, okay, it is well with my soul. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. How are you doing, guys, today? All right? Good, good. Amen, amen, amen. Get the blood going, circulation. <laughs> All right.
number three, a cappella. Ready? My saints, oh, the bless of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the sit down. Thank you. Thank you, fellas. Alexa. Amen, amen. Thank you, guys. Wow. The bliss. Wow. Uh, the bliss of this glory. You know what bliss is? Bliss is like super califragilistic, ichthyalidocious excitement. You know, it's like, wow. So, yeah, you can go walk in front of me, Josh. All right. So I hope you got, anybody got any bliss today that their sins are all gone? <laughs> I know it's a, I know it's the quote unquote, you know, last weekend of summer and a lot of folks are away and, uh, but I'm glad you're here. Praise the Lord. Um, beautiful day to be together again and um, praise the Lord. Yesterday, we had a nice time out doing some public ministry. <laughs> a few of us went out there, and uh, this one guy in his SUV, you know, he made sure he honked, and, you know, he genuinely was, uh, and I just looked at him, I just, like, started laughing, and he just was like, uh, people are nuts, people are just so crazy, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know what he thought I was going to do, throw my Bible into the middle of 34 and run from Ami, but it was just like, yeah, I was like, that's, that's, that's very good, that, that's good, you know, but anyway, but uh, the Lord is coming back, man. He's coming back to get us, and I'm looking forward to that day. And uh, it's just great to be together again, you know, as, uh, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And we see it approaching, and uh, we just got to huddle up, shoulder up, and just keep on keeping on, man, because the Lord is coming. He's coming. He's coming. As sure as you came here today, he is coming back for you. And uh, we did some things this week. We had some open uh, public ministry. Uh, we sent $5,000 to Maurice LaPierre for his help in Haiti. So some of you gave towards that, and some of us put, ex we put some more from our coffers into that. And uh, if the Lord is coming back, I don't want a big lump of money to be sitting in the bank. Uh, we're being wise, of course, and I have people that make sure I'm wise. They keep me in check. But you know what? I, if we start to see that day approaching, I say burn out the tank. I say burn out the tank and just, if you want to keep your life, give it away. That's what our beloved founding pastor, Mel, used to tell us. You want to keep your life, give it away. So amen to that. So pray for Brother Maurice. Uh, he's trying to get his Bible conferences going all over the, all over the, the, uh, the country over there in Haiti. Uh, even if anybody has, a little, I know most people are off tomorrow, and if you want to get out a little bit in the morning, uh, Brother Brian's going to do a little bit of Operation Jerusalem in the morning, early before all the barbecues start, so uh, I'll send that text out later if anybody wants to go out and do a little distribution. We had a guy at around, what, 10 o'clock maybe, 10, 15, Mike, what do you call He came running in the building, and he came looking for, I guess, information about the church. He said he got something on the door. He didn't want to stay. Maybe he had to run back to his church. But he asked us some very interesting questions if you pre-trib dispensational or, you know, you don't get that if you're just a casual observer. So, uh, so if you think it's not making an impact, it is. So keep that, you know, if you want to be a part of that, you can. Thursday, we'll have Bible study. Um, rescue mission is Friday. If uh, I'll send more information about that. Uh, and this Saturday, we're going to hopefully start something. All of the fairs, the boogeyman has scared away all the fairs. Um, when people come together, the boogeyman emerges. But um, the boogeyman scared away all the fairs. Old Bridge Day, Saltwater Day, Hazlitt Day, Aberdeen Day, Matawan Day, 
human day, look at a human being day. Like every day that you could think of where you could interact with a fellow homo sapien uh, has been basically canceled uh, in our cancel culture craziness. So, but you know what's not canceled? The English town auction isn't canceled. And I went there yesterday, because I'm a New Jersey noob, I've never been there. So I went there yesterday after we did a little public ministry, and I was like, wow, there were tons of people, there were tables set up, there were regular folks, who's selling the junk from their, gar you know, their, their garage, who's selling something fancy? I spoke to the lady, said, I want to give a table and give stuff away. And she made it clear, if I'm paying the money, she was like, couldn't care less what I did with the table. So we're going to try to get there tomorrow and reserve a table and maybe for the month of September and October, while it's still nice out and we'll be using a lot of Saturdays for these fairs, we'll avail anybody who wants to come for an hour or two or three or four and just be there and just uh, give out Bibles, give out tracts, give out books, preach the word. I mean, a, there was a lady doing tarot card readings across the hall, so if I, she can spin her entrails and mutter her nonsense, we can, we can show forth the truth. So we're going to try to start that for the months of, of September and October, and then we'll try in that window, try to see if we can get back into the Freehold Mall as well. So while the weather's still nice, get out there at that, that flea market, and then maybe when the weather's not so nice, uh, get back into the Freehold Mall. Um, that sound good? That sound good? All right. Uh, I'm, ex I'm excited about it. I was walking around like, wow, wow. Oh, churros over here. Wow. You know, <laughs> I get some food too to go. Uh, so Brother Spurgeon, two weeks. Brother Spurgeon is coming. Don't go on vacation that week. Don't, don't wash your hair that morning. Don't hit the snooze button that morning and just be like, I need to go food shopping. You can do it afterwards. I'll do it for you. All right, just make that day a day that you could get here. Bring some friends. Invite some family. Invite people you know uh, that don't want to hear me yammer on, but you want to hear the Brother Spurgeon. He's always a blessing. He's coming on the 20th. Uh, invite people. And then the following week, there are 17 of us from our little Jersey tribe. 17 of us are going to speculate in New York for our youth camp that we cl uh, collaborate with, um, with the church in Staten Island, a church in Rochester. So keep those things in prayer. If you're going, I know campers, I was told yesterday it's $100 for a camper, and uh, I'm supposed to get a permission slip today from Bob Bowman so I could disseminate that to everybody. And uh, if not, I'm just going to make my own. So that's, that's coming up. Youth camp. Um, some things to pray about. Keep the Duva family in prayer. Um, keep that in prayer. Uh, keep each other in prayer. Like it's just a, it's crazy. And the crazy doesn't stop going away because the people in power don't want to let the crazy go. Because when you tell people it's crazy, you can control them really well. So keep, uh, keep each other in prayer. Keep the Duva family in prayer. We're trying to get a chance to see them and get in to see them. And uh, we're also praying about maybe creating a second Sunday school class. So we're praying about that you know, with some of the not so older kids, but the not so younger kids, because right now it's the old schoolhouse, and we kind of did that. And it worked for a long time in American education, but I know it's hard for the teachers to keep a three-year-old and maybe a 10-year-old at the same attention level. So we're going to try to give you some more information about that, of parents and, and stuff about that, but we're praying about that, and uh, we'll be in touch with you about that. And last but not to be the least, Jacob Colon is uh, shipping out tomorrow. Now, Jacob, why don't you come on down here, Jacob? I'm going to embarrass the snot out of you, Jacob. All right? So if you don't know what Jacob looks like, this is Jacob. If you know Jacob Cohn. And a lot of us have known him since he's a puppy. And uh, he's grown up now into a, he's grown up now a man now. He's puffing his chest out. You see it? And uh, he's getting out and he's going to serve our country and do a noble thing. So we thank him for that. And uh, I want you to see his face because we're not going to see his face around here you know, for a while, and uh, I know that's hard on mom and dad and some of the sisters. I know Olivia's like, I hate that. <laughs> I, but, you know, I didn't want to say that out loud. But, um, you know, it's going to be an absence, but I want you to see his face because I want you to remember to pray for him. All right? He's not going to Bible school. He's going to the military. So there's going to be all types of people there. Get a shot of him. All right? There's all types of people there. And uh, put his name on the fridge, and his brother Aaron is over in uh, New Mexico, right? He's in New Mexico serving with the Air Force. He's going to eventually be in North Carolina, possibly. <laughs> but, uh, Jacob, did you want to maybe say anything? You want to say anything? Maybe bow or pray? I uh, since he's on the side, wasn't expecting this whatsoever. Thank you, Pat. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> this is a lot better than that. I'll be doing plenty of that. But uh, I guess the only thing I have to say is to God be the glory, really. Like, I won't be able to do this without him. So, like, there's nothing else to say except all my praise and thanks goes to him. And, of course, my mother and father. But, you know, ma- mainly the Lord. And, yeah, that's, that's just about all I got. Yeah, that's a that's a big deal. That's a big deal. It's a big uh, it's a big blessing. And uh, in a you know in a culture where authority, law enforcement, military is so vilified, you know God's people should be the first to stand up and like thank a veteran, thank a soldier, thank your law enforcement because you know God is not the author of confusion. And all this nonsense out there with all this anarchy and this hate and this anger and this tearing stuff down. They don't want to come and find me in a restaurant and ask me to do anything like that because that's a lot of that stuff is I get some of the stuff I get the need for reform but a lot of this destroying life for the sake of anger and, and all this stuff so brother we commend you we thank you and we we want to pray for you and bless God for you so let's have a word of prayer and then brother Eli will sing again all right Heavenly Father we thank you we praise you for the Lord Jesus thank you for this wonderful time to come together Lord thank you for this space and the safety you give us, Lord, to be able to meet without fear of, like, uh, someone with a machine gun, you know, asking what we're doing. Lord, those days may come, Lord, but we're thankful, Lord, for the freedom we have, Lord, to meet and worship in this place and at this time. And we pray, Lord, we would be found faithful. I pray that you look down on this little group in Aberdeen, New Jersey, Lord, and I know your mind and heart is upon your people, Lord. You couldn't care less about Washington or the United Nations, Lord, or what's going on all over the world, but your hearts and minds are to your people. And I pray, Lord, especially for my brother Jacob. I know for his friend Chong, Lord, in a few months is going as well to the military. I pray your hand of protection upon him, Lord. I pray God speed to him, Lord. I pray you get him around some good brothers and sisters in Christ, some good Christians, Lord, that will be able to continue to grow in grace. I pray, Lord, your distress and the strain will not consume his faith, Lord. He would hold fast the things that he's been taught and the things that mom and dad and others, pastors and teachers, have put down into his heart and soul. And, Lord, when he feels those lonely nights laying in his bunk, Lord, I pray he'd pray to you, Lord, and reach out to you, Lord, and call unto you. And, Lord, you teach him how to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, Lord, a good soldier for our country. But most importantly, Lord, let him be a light in that dark place, Lord. Let him be a light and a blessing. Let him be the most commendable person in his platoon, Lord. Let him be the one that is the first to answer, the first to jump up, the first to volunteer, Lord. Let him be a good Christian soldier, Father, and may he be a light that shines in a dark place. May you keep your hand of protection on him and on his brother Aaron, all our military, Lord, all our law enforcement, Father. We pray for our dear country, Lord, and we pray righteousness might be in the land. Not a party, not a position, not anything like that, but just righteousness, Lord. That your people wouldn't be discouraged, Lord, that we would keep our eyes on you and continue going forward, Lord. And may today just be a day that brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Eli. Okay, I have a little testimony. I like testimonies. And it's a real blessing. Uh, first of all, the testimony about this song. Again, I like to read the background of the song, the history of it. And uh, so I, uh, I read it last night. And um, Jenny Havilland Hevel- Hevel- Hussey. She was born in 1874. And... Uh, she had a sister who was an uh, uh, invalid, and she had to take care of her uh, most of her life. Uh, Jenny uh, had arthritis. She had a, a extreme arthritis. And um, she was born in a farm uh, in New England. And uh, from she having arthritis, she started writing songs. She read a lot of hymns. And one of the hymns is uh, the one that we're going to be uh, singing today, Lead Me to Calvary. And uh, when she wrote that, uh, wh- the arthritis led her to write this song. And uh, Jenny had came to the experience saying, praise the Lord, even though, you know, she, she took care of her, 
sister, there was so much stress, and she came to a, a point where she's just praising the Lord, even though things was just uh, taking care of her, her sister. You know, that's all she had. That's what she did, and there was a, it was uh, it was hard for her, but she praised the Lord through the, all that. And um, when she praised the Lord, uh, she said, "Please make me willing to." to bury my cross daily without complaining. You, built, you bore yours for me. It was then that I shed, that, that, I, that I should, wrote, I'm sorry, I, I wrote it down. Anyway, the point I was, I was saying is, what she went through all this, she wrote that song through all this um, situation and she didn't complain. She was a good servant. And uh, the point I'm saying is, is yesterday, I, uh, I was on the street. I'm not going to mention. I'm not going to mention the, my, uh, my sister, my dear sister, but was on that corner putting out a sign. First of all, when I was there in the morning, I couldn't find my brothers. Uh, it, was, it was a little late, and uh, I thought, okay. And then I said, let me drive back to that corner. And then I saw my brother walking, and I said, Brian. I was like, oh, that's great. I was looking forward to go on the street. I haven't been on the street in a while. I like the street. I like people. So I was drawn to go that morning. And uh, so when I got there, saw my brothers and sister, and then my sister came, and I was so happy to see her. Stand up. And walk. Uh, sister's going through a lot. Uh, meaning, uh, she knows the neighborhood, she knows a lot of people, and going on our corner, um, you know, when you when you go to somebody else's corner, it's okay. But when you're in your own territory, you f it, the, the fear comes in. I've had that. I've had it. I've had it actually when I started right there. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to let that get to me. And it, it took a while. It, it is because I, I work in this town. I know a lot of people. And, and, and it is big. And, and so I knew exactly what she was going through. And so I was putting out the sign. And, and once in a while, I, I was looking at her. And she had a sign. And I was like, it was great. It was really good, you know, seeing her growing because she's going through a battle. I knew exactly what she was going through. So she mentioned that to me a few times. And uh, so, so she was out there. And at the end, I had to leave. I, I had an appointment at 11 o'clock. So I went across the street, and I had this sign right here. That's the sign I had out, out there. And she says, can I have your sign? And she took that sign. She, she was probably watching that sign. The Lord probably spoke to her. I don't know. But she wanted that sign. And, you know, to the next level, you know, to the next level, you know. And she put it out there. So that really filled up my cup yesterday. That was like, uh, I don't know, I have to just share that with you. And that was a servant. Didn't complain. Just sit there and stand there and just keep the word out there. It was amazing. It was really amazing. So thank you, sister. Let's sing the song. Praise the Lord. King of my life, upon thee now, shine till the glory be. Lest I forget. Calvary, lest I forget a sin, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. 
ですけど、いいですね。サンドいいですね。<笑>パスタ If you have your Bible, give me a second to actually get that.、Um, turn to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Oh, turn the page. John chapter 9. <laughs> John chapter 9. <coughs> give me a thumbs up so I can、uh, I'm good. John chapter 9. Down there by verse 1. I don't know. You might want to stick something in John 9. I don't have a lot of different places I'm going to turn you to. We're probably going to stay in John 9 for most of this,、uh, most of this morning. And、um, I'll be very honest. Whoa, that's hot. Right? I'll be very honest with you that、uh, this, this message is for Jesus. This one's, this one's just for him. I mean, it's not going to be a lot of teaching, it's just going to be a chance, I hope, to put a little shout in you. I hope it encourages you.、Uh, but you know, most of all, it's a chance to just brag on Jesus. And if you're saved, to remind you that you've never been the same since you met him. And if you're not saved, to provoke you maybe to want to get to know him and find out who this great God is. John chapter 9 is where we are. Ever notice, as you read through the Gospels, maybe you've noticed this, but ever notice how many miracles Jesus performed on his way to somewhere else? In Matthew chapter 9, for instance, Jesus Christ is on his way to heal Jairus' daughter. He ends up helping a woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus is leaving Jericho. It looks like he's on his way somewhere else. And two blind men stop the Messiah dead in his tracks when they cry out for mercy. And in John chapter 8, at the end, we're right at the end. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am, asserting his deity as the Son of God. In 59, then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Jesus Christ is getting away from a bunch of religious hypocrites. And that's kind of like my would like to get away from them as well. Nobody wants to be around some stuffed shirt, hypocritical Pharisee, some do what I say, not what I do kind of, you know, liar, Nancy Pelosi. But in John chapter 9, verse 2, you'll see what a change, what a change came into this man's life when Jesus just passed by. Look at verse 2. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? Oh, I'm sorry, verse 1. Verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, so he's getting away from these knuckleheads, and as he's getting away from them, he has his eye on somebody. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. So as he's getting away from these religious numbskulls, these dead men's bones containing lying sepulchers, he's running away from them who Jesus never wanted to have any part of. He passes by a blind man from birth. Who had a heart to see the Son of God. I'll tell you right now, Jesus Christ is not interested in the claptrap cathedrals. He's not worried about what's going on at the synagogue, the temple, or the mosque. You know what God's eyes are? His eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth to see those whose heart is perfect toward Him. He's just looking for people that are looking for Him. So He gets away from this religious dreck and He sees this one guy begging on the side of a road and He passes by. And what a change comes into this man's life when Jesus just passed by. Verse 2. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, for he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that it, the works of God should be manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. This is an interesting thing, right? He spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. That's some holy spit. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. 
He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. This is a miracle, people. This is a guy that was radically changed. This is someone who is never the same because the Son of God passed by, because the Son of God took interest, because the Son of God stooped to get his hands dirty in some dirt. He opened this man's eyes forever, and he was irrevocably changed. And you know, I stand here today, and you stand here today. What a change in your life since Jesus has passed by. Don't ever forget all the stuff, all the intellectual arguments, all the things that happen, all the doubts you have. Remember, you were going one way, and then Jesus Christ came by your way, and now you're going a different way. And when all cut through all the nonsense, don't, and Brother Jacob, don't ever forget, Jesus Christ has changed your life, and Jesus Christ has saved your life, and you are never the same because the Son of God, the blessed Son of God, took some interest in you and came by your way. So you know what we're going to do this morning? We're going to brag on Jesus. We're going to rejoice in Jesus. We're going to remember the day that he came by and passed by our way and opened our eyes and remember that we've never been the same since Jesus passed by. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord Jesus Christ, for condescending to come by my wretched soul, to come by my way, to stand in my place, to die for my sins, to take my hell and to rise again, to give me eternal life. And Father, I'll be honest with you, if nobody gets anything out of this, Lord, I pray you would get something out of this, Father. I pray you'd be praised and lifted up and magnified and some sinners who've been called out of darkness into your marvelous light would rejoice. May there be a shout, may there be some tears, may there be some just remembering that at the end of the day, you saved us and we're not the same, Lord, since you passed by. We pray, Lord, if someone is here today and is not saved, May you pass by his or her way, Father, and may they trust you as Savior, and may their lives never be the same because you've passed by them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stay right there in John 9. We're not going anywhere. First thing I want to say is this. When Jesus passed by, there was a change in this man's life. Everybody could see it. There was no doubt about it. Look at verse number one. See verse number one? And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Can I tell you, this man, the big change in this man, this man went from darkness to deliverance because Jesus passed by. It wasn't church, it wasn't religion, it wasn't effort, it wasn't turning over a new leaf, it wasn't somebody put a hundred shekels in the cup. It was just the simple fact that Jesus, the Son of God, came by his way and touched his life, and this man went from darkness to to deliverance. It says he was blind from birth. Verse 2. Master, who did sin? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. Guys, that man is a lot like you. Because he was blind from birth the same way you're called a transgressor from the womb. I mean, right from birth, man, you're trouble. Right? Adelaide is the exception. No, I'm right. Hey, right from birth. You learn how to say no, you learn how to rebel, you learn how to lie, you learn how to cheat, you learn how to steal, you learn how to stink, uh, you learn how to stink too, you learn how to stink, how to, I don't even know what I was going to say, sneak, right? Guess what? Because why? You've got a sin nature that you got from birth. You were blind to God from birth. You were fallen from birth. You were separated God from birth. And look at verse number six. Not just that, like this man, look at six. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of his spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man. We never know his name. We never find out his name. It's never mentioned. Look at verse 17 at the end. Uh, actually, the beginning of 17. They say unto the blind man. That's all we know about this guy. He was the blind man. He's got no name. I don't know if his name was Fred. I don't know if he went to college. I don't know what religious background he was. I'm assuming he was a Jew, of course. He was Jewish. I don't know if he, you know, how much money he got from panhandling every day. All I know, all the Holy Spirit records, is he's the blind man. The blind. Read through the chapter over and over again. The blind man. The blind man. The blind man. You know what that tells me? That his blind condition was his only identity to God. That's all he saw. You know what that says to me? Just like you, the same way God sees you without Jesus Christ, one way. Lost. 
You could be a lost Muslim. You could be a lost Catholic. You could be a lost Buddhist. You could be a lost American. You could be a lost atheist. You could be a lost anything. We put all these names on ourselves. But you know what God sees you? Blind man. Blind man. Blind man. Blind man. Lost. In the dark. All the names we give ourselves, right? Denominations. I'm Presbyterian. Well, I'm Baha'i. I'm Hindu, right? All the names we give ourselves, denominations, titles. I'm a PhD. I'm a you know, I'm a DDD, I'm a, I, I took some LSD, all these things we give ourselves, right? The degrees, the achievements, the affiliations, I'm part of this club, I drive this car. You know what those things mean to God? Nothing! They don't mean anything to God. I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, I'm independent, I'm unaffiliated. You know what these things really mean to God at the end of the day? Nothing! It's your heart! It's always been your heart! But we pile on all these names, and God cuts through all these names, and he says, oh, yeah, you're the blind man. Woo, does that rub the pride the wrong way? Blind man. I was a good, faithful Italian. I ate the sauce on Sunday, and I, I went to, you know, I was a PB&J. I went to, you know, Pastor P Christmas and Easter. I did all those things, and I brought the palms home for Grandma, and I, you know, I was a good Pentecostal, and I got baptized in water, or I was this, or I, was, I went to college, and I have, you know, I have a degree, and I have this, and I make this much money. I got this many zeros after my salary, and I blah, blah, blah. God's like, oh, yeah, I remember you. You're the blind man. God cuts through everything. And he just says, you are lost. Even you, I'm the Marine. I'm the Air Force. I'm the five-star general. You know what? God looks at the five-star general and the grunt without Jesus Christ is the same way. Oh, you're the blind man. All the same. You guys that are saved, remember what it was like to just be the blind man? Remember what that was like? What it was just like to be lost? And that you were consumed with the fact that you were lost? Have you forgotten that you were lost? When you got saved, it wasn't just, oh, you know, I really need to find something to give my life fulfillment. No, you were, you were lost. You were in the dark. You know, you see me sometimes, I think it was last week, I don't know if it was Chong maybe, he saw, I don't know if it was you, but I was in the sun and he saw me squinting. Did you ask me about squinting last week? It's okay, you're not in trouble. But I was squinting in the sun because when I was eight years old, I almost lost my left eye. Got hit by a big branch of a thorn bush and I almost lost my left eye. And I remember growing up, with this fear of going totally blind. They used to make me wear these big sucker glasses with these big thick lenses that couldn't break because they said, look, you're a kid. If you hit your other eye, then you're going to be blind because I'm legally blind in this eye. And I remember that fear of being in the darkness, of not being able to see things. If you had to give away a sense, what sense would you give away? Probably the last one you give away is sight because you want to be able to see. But do you remember what it was like to be in the dark? Remember when you didn't know what you didn't know? When you couldn't see where you were supposed to be going? When you didn't even see what you couldn't see? I remember the darkness. I remember the fear. Look at verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Do you see how the Bible just runs over that? Do you see how huge of a thing that is? When Jesus Christ passed by, this man's eyes were open, brother. This man's eyes were open for the first time in his life. And guys, when Jesus Christ came into your heart, when the Holy Spirit of God took away that sin and dwelt inside of you forevermore, you know what God was doing? He was opening your eyes. And for the first time, you could see. You could see. You could see. I can see. I understand what life is about. I understand where I'm going. I understand where I came from. I understand the news. I understand what's happening in the world. I know why they're fighting in the Middle East. I know why they're fighting on the streets of Portland. I can diagnose it. Why? Because he's anointed my eyes and I can see. And I remember being a lost person, going to the monks, going to the pastor, going to the self-help seminar, and nobody could open my eyes. Nobody could answer the question. But I started reading this Bible, and it was like God put the floodlights on my soul. Don't ever get over the fact that you were blind without him from birth, and God opened your eyes. You can see, you ever seen those videos? 
of like an infant that's born deaf and they hook up those things and then they hear for the first time. If you got any heart at all, that touches your heart. It makes me cry like a big brother and baby. You see that look on that baby's face when they hear mama's voice for the first time or they hear daddy's voice for the first time or they hear sound for the first time. Have you ever seen those videos? Just nod your head. Ever seen them? You ever seen the joy on that baby's face? You ever seen the wonder on that infant's eyes? You ever seen the smile that creeps across their cheeks where they can suddenly come out of the dark? Brother, you were in the dark and God opened your eyes. What happened to the joy? Where's the wonder? Where's the smile? Maybe you need to reacquaint yourself with the great physician. Maybe you need to just spend some time alone with him and remind yourself, Father, I was blind, deaf, and dumb, and you loosed my tongue, you opened my eyes, you let me see, and you let me speak. I don't ever want to give it over the fact that I was just a blind beggar on the side of the road. You know what God did? Open my eyes. Because I don't know about you, but I was looking for the truth. I was desperately seeking for it. I wanted to know what life was about, didn't you? I wanted to know why I was alive. I fought with the stupid dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at New York University in a scholarship group, and I told this dean, I said, I'd rather be a squirrel in Washington Square Park because at least a squirrel doesn't wrestle with existential questions of human existence. That's who I was. I was looking everywhere for what's life about. But then I met Jesus. I met Jesus. He said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And I woke the dungeon flamed with light. I've never been the same since I met the one who is who he says he is and does what he says he does. No backdoor deals, no shady under the counter, no lockdown for thee but not for me. None of that stuff with Jesus Christ. He got down in the dirt so you could open your eyes. Look at verse 13. I told you this wasn't going to be a lot of teaching. Verse 13 they brought to the Pharisees him that was a four time that a four time was blind, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Can you just go back in your mind? Can you remember the day Jesus Christ opened your eyes? Just go back there. You might have been five. You might have been fifteen. You might have been twenty, like me. Maybe you were fifty years old. I don't know where you were, but when Jesus opened your eyes could see clearly and you could see things that weren't there before maybe it was love that's what love is like that's what joy is like that's what peace is like that's what purpose is like can you just go back right now and remember the day that God turned the lights on for you and you saw the peace of having your sins forgiven and why you were alive don't ever get over that you were a four-time blind, but you're not that way anymore. You'll never be that way again. You were never the same after Jesus Christ passed by. Look at verse number 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Do you remember how shocked your family was to see the change in you? I don't know what happened. He used to do this, and now he reads the Bible. He used to curse like this, and now he thanks me when I serve him dinner. He used to be like this. He used to punch holes in the wall and rip glass out of the screen door, and now he helps me sweep up after the mess. I don't know what happened to him. Man, when people were shocked when they saw that in you, like, what is going on with you? Look at verse number 24. Then again they called the man. You say amen whenever you want. Then again they called the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise, these pious hypocrites. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, <laughs> I like this guy. Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Remember in the beginning back there, remember just knowing that Jesus Christ had turned the lights on in your soul? 
You didn't understand all the doctrines. You couldn't rightly divide the word if you had, you know, 50 books helping you. You didn't know anything. You just knew something is different. Something is different. I got saved 20 years ago. I didn't understand a lot of stuff. I wasn't even sure if I was saved. You know, I, I think I was. I called on the Lord. I didn't understand eternal security and all the great doctrines of this book. You know, one thing I knew is Jesus had saved me. Jesus had forgiven me. Jesus, and guys, just you guys going away, you know, you guys go through this life, all the stuff of life, all the questions, all the doubts, just remember, one thing you know, Jesus Christ saved you. One thing you know is you had no idea what life was about, and now you do. You had no idea how to be saved, now you do. You had no idea how to get to heaven, now you do. Because God did something. You know, John Wesley wrote that great song, And Can It Be? And he says this line in there. Sounds like the blind man. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. Hey, guys, are you awake? I don't mean like physically, but spiritually. Are you awake? Amen. You awake? Are you free today? Are you free? Have you seen the light? Amen. Then don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. You know what you should do? First Peter tells us what you should do. Show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's let you bask in that marvelous light. You go out on a beautiful day like yesterday. Wasn't it beautiful? You just go outside. You feel good, don't you? Doesn't it feel good? There's no clouds. The sun is shining. It just felt good to walk around and be outside yesterday. Today's, and that's probably why half the people aren't here. Today's just another beautiful day, right? Just to walk around and be outside. You know what? You are in his marvelous light. It just feels good to know I'm saved. It just feels good to know the truth. It just feels good to know I know him and he knows me and we are peas and carrots. Just to know that I've got a savior and I am my beloved's and my beloved is my, you know what you gotta do? Praise him. Praise the one that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I can remember the day I got saved. I can remember. You know why we plugged that Operation Jerusalem packet? Because that happened to me in 1998 and I got saved. My eyes got opened. And I can remember reading that Operation Jerusalem packet that was left on my door like a man who found water in the desert. I was desperate. I was despairing of life. I was wandering around in this constant state of panic. Well, out the si outside it was great. How you doing? I'm good. How's everything going? I'm good. How's NYU? It's good. How's life? It's good. Inside I felt judgment. I felt fear. I thought about doing things to myself, hurting myself, becoming a martyr. I didn't know what I had to do. And when I got to the very end of my rope that next morning, this little plastic bag is hanging on my door. So when somebody tells me God's not real, it's just, it's, it's got to make me chuckle. It's like, I didn't tell anybody on the face of the earth what I was going through. I never told anybody because I would get the looks that you give me sometimes like Pat's nuts. I wouldn't do anything like that. And I just cried out to God kind of with this despair, my heart shaking and my body rattling. I was like, God, whoever you are, if something's out there, show me the way. And then this thing shows up on my door. And you know what the thing is in there? You can have eternal life. Christ died for your sins. I remember it was like I was crawling in the desert and somebody just showed me a pool of living water and I drank and I've never ever been the same ever again. Where did it happen to you? Did it happen to you? Was it a, was it at a church meeting? Was it a friend talking to you? Was it a packet on your door? Was it a track left in a gas station? Was it a, I don't know, was it a parent just sitting down with you like good mom or dad? Where was it? Was it a crazy guy that used to work in your house, right, this might have told you some things, right? What was it? Did it happen? Can you go back to your birthday and remember that day somewhere it was there? You know, so I might not know exactly the day, but I do know there was a day because I signed every track I got, every track I read that first month. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm in, I'm in. Let me sign this one and, and have it in there. But you know what? You know what D.L. Moody said? He said, it is not necessary that we should be able to tell where or how we have been converted. But it is important that we should be able to tell that we are converted, that we are saved, that we are regenerated, that we have been changed. Can you tell? Do you have the day? Go to Acts 26. I'm not going to turn you to more than a couple of places. Hold your place in, in uh, 
John and go to Acts, which is the next book. I know, I have you staring at, just stare at the pages a little bit. I know it's not a lot of flipping, but I just, I just felt uh, this is what the Lord would want me to say. Acts 26, 16. I want you to see what this change was. This was not a change for you to click a box on your college application. This was not a change that you just change your religious affiliation when they put you in a hospital bed. No, 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 no. This was a radical, amazing, supernatural change that God did on you when he opened your eyes. And in Acts 26, 16, the Lord is commissioning Paul. Paul's reciting his, his testimony, and he says, God told him, but rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have purposed unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering me from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom thou I send me, to open their eyes, and watch what that means, and to turn them from darkness to light. Okay, what's that mean? And from the power of Satan unto God. What would that do for me? That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. When God saved you, man, he forgave your sins. He took you out of the mouth of the lion and he gave you an inheritance by being a member of his body. It was huge what he did. It wasn't just a prayer. It was a life changing moment, a soul saving moment, an irrevocable moment that God did for you. And I don't ever want to get over it. And we should never get over the fact that that's what God did for me. And that's what God did for me. And if he never did another thing for you, that's enough to sing his praises for all eternity. But he's given you more. Hasn't he? Hasn't he given you more? Shame on your flesh for hesitating in there. Hasn't he? He's blessed you more than you ever deserved. He gave you more than you could even fathom. I look at those four souls that God put in my house. I can't get over the fact that God gave me a wife and God gave me a child, children. I'll never get over the fact that God let people look at me and trust me. I'll never get over the fact that God would let me be a part of something like this. I'll never go over the fact that God would give me a Bible and put his Holy Spirit inside of me and whisper his promises to me. I don't ever want to get over the fact he's blessed this dirt bag exceeding abundantly above all that I could ask or think. You know what? Thank you, Jesus, and I'll kiss your feet for all eternity belongs right there. That's what belongs right there. It's about time we just turn everything else off and turn ourselves back to Jesus Christ and get back to the fact, you know what? If he keeps you locked up, locked down, thrown in a FEMA camp, you know what, you know what? Praise God anyway. Thank God anyway. Lift him up anyway. Preach about him anyway. If they got to put one between your eyes while you're singing his praises, then baby, that's a good way to go. That's a good way to go. I'm not asking for it. All right, military, don't turn on us. But I'm not asking for it. But you know what? It's a good way to go. Just burn your life out. Thanking him, praising him, enjoying his life. You don't have to go in the corner. If you could, you did. Hey, you could still be a witness wherever you are. We don't make any kind of hierarchy here of the different things that go on here. Some of you got to work. Some of you have to not. I don't know. I don't chase you. But if God puts something on your heart where you can just do something for him, do it. Do it while you can. But you know what the most important thing is? And just enjoy being in his light. Remind yourself that you're in his light. Just bask in his light. Walk in his light. Look at John chapter 9, verse 8. Go back to John. Oh, boy. John chapter 9. Can I tell you this man's life, we went from darkness to deliverance. Can I tell you what else it did? This man's life went from pointless to purposeful. Because Jesus passed by. That's the difference. John 9, 8. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Folks, after Jesus Christ opened his eyes, this man went from being an outcast to being the object of everybody's attention. Look at verse 9. All the neighbors are talking about him. He was trending. Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I'm he. <laughs> Ten. Therefore said they unto him, How are thine eyes opened? He answered and said, uh, A man that is called Jesus made clay 
and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. You just got to tell people what God did for you. Verse 12, then said they unto him, where is he? He said, I know not. Do you notice all these people that probably passed him by while he was begging are now looking at his life and asking about Jesus? Look at verse number 13. They brought to the Pharisees, oh, him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Watch, he says the same thing. He said unto them, you put clay upon my eyes and I washed and do see. <laughs> he didn't change the message for the big shots or the little guys. He just told them straight the truth, what God had done to him. And all the big shots who couldn't care less before now want to talk to this man. Wow. And the Lord let a no-name beggar brag about the king of glory. The Lord let a no-name beggar brag about him and show some other beggars where they can get bread. That's all we're doing. One beggar telling another beggar where they can get bread. And folks, when Jesus Christ changes your life, you know what happens? People pay attention. They're watching you, Christian. People are watching you. You know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3? He said to those believers, Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. He's watching. You might be all the Bible somebody ever reads because they're watching you. You don't think they're watching you, but mess up for the first time and watch how they've been watching you. Lose your temper the first time. Watch how many people are watching you. Be a hypocrite the first time. Watch how many people were watching you. They're watching. And if you go to chapter 9, look at verse 16. I'll tell you this. Not everyone's going to receive your testimony. Not everyone's going to be thrilled that you're a believer. Not everyone's going to be excited that your eyes are open. Because you say your eyes are open, the implication is theirs are not. 9.16. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Oh, perish the thought. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Keep reading. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him. You see, not everyone's going to receive your testimony. Look at verse 19. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? Jump to verse 23. Therefore said his parents, He is of age. Ask him. You know what they did? They threw him under the bus. And hey, you get saved. Not everyone's going to believe you. And guess what? Your family may very well forsake you. Like they threw this man under the bus. They're like, I don't know. Ask him. Right? Isn't that the truth for some of you? Your family sometimes turn their back on you. That doesn't change the fact that he saved you. And if your family's going to reject you, at least you, you're with Jesus. I mean, don't ever give up on him. Look at verse 24. You know what leaders may do? Leaders may revile you like they reviled your Savior. Look at 24. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How opens he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him. They scolded him. They virtue signaled at him. They looked down at him. They chided him. We be, what is it? Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. You know what? I'll I want to be in that number. I want to be in God's number. I don't want to be with one of his enemies. I don't ever want to be identified with one of God's enemies. I want to always be known as one of his friends. I want to be in that crowd. And if those stuffed shirt, lying, two-faced sacks or nothing will look at you and say, oh, you follow them, I follow this guy, then I want to be as far away from that person as possible, and I'll just be here with Jesus. I'll stay over here. I'll stay with the one you called a, a friend of publicans and sinners. I'll stay with the one you called a glutton and a drunkard. I'll stay with that guy that you vilified and reviled. I'm not going to revile again. I'm just going to stay with him because he's the one that opened my eyes. He's the one that turned me from darkness to light. He's the one that forgave my sins. And you know what they might do to you? Verse 30, they may cast you out. 30, 
Then an the man answered and said, this guy's got guts. I like this guy. I can't wait to see him in heaven. This man answered and said unto him, well, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. <laughs> oh, the irony. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, that's hate speech. Get him off YouTube. Get him off Twitter. Kick him off Facebook. Community strike. Community strike. Community strike. They said unto him, they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. They cast him out. They shut him out. They tried to black him out. They tried to push him out. And they may do all those things to us, but it'll never change the fact that your eyes are open, and now you have purpose. It only proves the fact that you're making an impact. If some guy got on YouTube and made a video that unicorns are in you know, Southeast Asia and you ride this rainbow down and you land in a pot of gold which takes you up on the back of a turtle into the universal cosmos of joy and peace, you know what? I wouldn't censor it. I'd get a good laugh out of it because it's poppycock. It's nonsense. You're only dangerous if you're telling the truth. And the fact that they're shutting this down and kicking this off and removing that and trying to get rid of this and censor God from here and censor God from there and take Jesus out of here and close this church, close that church, leave the pot dispensary open, leave the abortion clinic open, leave the liquor store open and shut everything else out. You know what that tells me? Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the life. And when they cast you out and they black you out and they pull you off this and they kick you out of their home and they put you out of the synagogue, the Bible says rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, because it's a sure sign that you are on the right track. They hated him, and they're going to hate you. Do you know that COVID lockdowns have led to a threefold increase in depression? I read a story. People are just sitting around wondering, what's the point? I read a story about a 91-year-old man that threw himself to his death because he wouldn't be allowed to go see his family. You know what? People are starting to catch on. Like, what is in this pause? They're just like, why am I alive? Like, what am I doing? What am I here for? You ever had those thoughts before you were saved? Do you remember what it was like to go through life just begging for something like this blind man was? Just looking for something? You were in the dark waiting for someone or something to fill your cup until Jesus passed by. He said, I'm the missing piece. I'm the whole. I'm the thing you want. I'm the truth. I'm the way. I'm the life. We sing a song. All my life long I had panted for some draught from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within, feeding on the husks around me till my strength was almost gone. Longed my soul for something better, only still to hunger on. Poor I was and sought for riches, something that would satisfy. But the dust I gathered round me only mocked my soul's sad cry. And the chorus resounds, hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings. Through his blood I now am saved. That's who you were looking for the whole time. It was Jesus. That's the one that could give you joy. It was Jesus. That's the one who is life. It's Jesus. Amen. Have you found him? He found me, and I found him. And this man went from a waste of a life, a beggar on the side of the road that nobody could give two shekels about, that he went from a waste of a life to worshiping the Son of God. Look at verse number 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? What if I ask you that question? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped. And Jesus didn't tell him to get up. Because Jesus is God. And so he was right to accept that worship. And he did. This beggar who was blind from birth wound up worshiping the Son of God while those who claimed to be good went on in their blindness. The Pharisees and the religious stuffed shirts, they went on in their blindness. Look at 39. And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not, like the blind man, might see. 
and that they which see, like the professing hypocrites, might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. If you were humble enough to say, Lord, I need your help, I would take your sins away. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. And if man, if some, somebody could just humble themselves enough to say, I need you, Lord, you know what he'll do? He'll fix you up, he'll save your soul, he'll redeem your life. But it's the fact that you're proud, like those Pharisees, and you say, no, 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 I'm good, everything's good, we're all good, we just need a little Jesus sprinkles on our ice cream sundae once in a while to sweeten it up. No, 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 you are lost, you're weak, and it'll be a mess without him. You've got to have that humility to say, I need you, Lord, and all I do. And you'll say, oh, I'll open your eyes. But if not, you could just go on being blind. And if you want your life to change at all and keep changing for the good, you need Jesus to pass by. Those religious people missed him. I encourage you, brethren, don't miss the Savior. Don't miss him. Go back to 9-1. I just got a few more stops left here. 9-1. Can I tell you, real change is never going to come from your own strength. You know why not? Verse 1. Because your natural state is fallen from birth. You were broken and bound from birth. You know why else you can't help yourself? Verse 8. Your resources are empty. That's why you're begging. That's why you're looking. That's why you're searching the husks of this world to find something that satisfies that part of you that was meant to commune with God and will never be fulfilled until you fellowship with God. You need God. Saved or lost, you need God. You've got to come to that place. Listen, if I write 2 plus 2 on the board and leave it like that, that problem will never solve itself naturally. Two plus two, two plus two. It takes somebody from the outside of the problem to come by and solve it. And you and I sit in a troubled world, a problems world, problems within, problems without. We can't fix them. We need a supernatural work of God to enter into the situation and give us the solution. You could try discipline, you could try psychology, you could try religion, you can try grit, but the rubber band will always snap back to its form. You could say, ooh, I'm just going to discipline myself to be good. It's going to snap back. The minute you let up, it's going to snap back. You need something to break you and make you new. That's what you need. That's what Jesus Christ can do. You know what else you can't expect? Don't expect your loved ones, your family, your friends, your acquaintances, to lend you that lifeline that only Jesus can. They're nice. They give you a little buzz once in a while of warmth and heartache and a joy and peace, but they can't change you. They can't. Mom and dad, they're going to try to put as much Bible into you as they can, but mom and dad can't change you. Mom and dad's Christianity can't be your Christianity. Mom and dad's Savior doesn't by osmosis or heredity become your Savior. You need Jesus Christ. You need a personal walk. You need your own prayer time with him. You need your own Bible reading with him. You need to walk in his marvelous light. Look at verse 8. The neighbors... Where were all those neighbors before Jesus passed by? They were probably too busy. Go to Psalm 142. It's the only other place I'm going to flip you to. Psalm 142. Psalm 142. Psalm 142. You know, David, David figured it out pretty good. David hit the nail on the proverbial head. How are we doing so far, okay? Amen. Amen? All right. I'm just bragging on the Lord here. Thank you for just attending to my brag session. Psalm 142, look at verse number 4. You know what David realized? David learned all too well, the only person you could depend on is God Almighty. The only one that will never let you down is God Almighty. The only one who is faithful is God Almighty. I will disappoint you. I won't want to, but I will. Friends will disappoint you. Family will disappoint you. Good Christians will disappoint you. Because that's why I don't make promises. But he'll never disappoint you. He'll never let you down. He'll never dip the colors. He'll never break his word. And in Psalm 142, verse number 4, David says, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. 
I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Paul, I mean, David got it right. He says, nobody can help me, but you can help me, God. Nobody would even know me. Sounds like that beggar. But you know me, God. You'll rescue me, God. You'll never let me down, God. Isn't that the truth? That's the truth. I'm not, you see, we're not talking about a concept here. I don't pray to a concept. I don't pray to an ideology. I don't pray to a statue. I don't pray to a theory. I don't pray to a dogma. I don't pray to a creed. You know what I pray to? I pray to a person. You know who cares about me? A person. You know what I'm talking about here? A person that I have a real relationship with, that I'm really talking to right now in my head, that I really want you to know and fall more in love with. He is a real person. You need Jesus, not Christianity, to pass by. A personal relationship with him. Can you go? Don't go anywhere. March 27th, 1964, the New York Times published a piece called 37 Who Saw Murder Didn't Call the Police. It was a story of a woman named Kitty Genovese who was killed in, I believe, Queens, New York, over several hours despite desperate cries for help. She was knocking on apartment buildings, asking for help, and over a period of several hours, this man was killing this woman, and nobody turned the lights on, nobody opened the door, nobody got involved because they figured it was somebody else's problem. In fact, criminologists now call it the bystander effect. That somebody else will do it. Somebody else will help. And the bitter pill is, people, that people always worry about me, myself, and I first. That's it. They don't love their neighbor as themselves. They worry about themselves first. That's just a fact, Jack. Self-preservation. Can we go to John 9 again? We'll finish in John 9. Look at verses 18 to 23. I'm not going to read them again to you. Can I tell you that even his parents turned their back on him out of fear and self-preservation? They threw him under the bus. They probably sat there and said, what will the neighbors think? Where will we go to church? Where will we go to synagogue? Will they talk to us anymore? What about the barbecues? Will we get an invite anymore? If we identify with this Jesus freak of our son? Could be worse, right? You could be living in a Muslim country where your family might be seeking to kill you, to actively annihilate you for converting from the faith. Oh yeah, that happens all the time. That is the life of a Muslim background believer in most of the world. Your family even turns your back. Look at verse number, oh, don't look anywhere. You know, King David said it best, no man cared for my soul. Oh, they'll care about your job. They'll care about your education level. They'll care about your social status. They'll care about what you could bring to the party, but they don't care about his soul. They don't care about your soul. Why was this man begging if his parents cared enough to brush their own son? Isn't that weird? Why was he begging? Why wasn't his parents taking care of him? You know what David said in Psalm 27:10? When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. And I'm not going to paint it to say everybody's going to be thrilled that you don't go to the club anymore. And everybody's going to be thrilled that it's, you don't curse like a sailor anymore. And everybody's going to be thrilled that it's, you don't you know, drop dime bags like you used to and you know, live like a pig like you used to. Not everybody's going to be thrilled with you. But it should be enough that Jesus opened your eyes. It should be enough that he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And if that's the fate, then so be it. I put my chips on Jesus and that's where I'm going to let it ride. We need some people like that. John chapter 9, verse number 14. And the last thing you definitely don't need is more religion. Because more religion is the last thing you need to make a real lasting change in your life. We are not talking about religion. See verse 14? You know what they're doing in religion? And it was the Sabbath day. Oh, they were all hung up on the Sabbath. Religion is all hung up on rites and rituals and holy days and beads to spin and water to sprinkle and ashes to flip and days to go and money to drop. They're all hung up on that stupid stuff. It's like watching kids play with tinker toys. Like, what are you doing, God must be saying. I was courted, before I got saved, I was courted by a cult that was more concerned that I got baptized in water than my cries for help. I was like, man, how do I get rid of this sin? I got this sin problem. Oh, you just need to get baptized. What? You just need to get baptized. What? I made that sound too. It was like, 
man, I was like, what? What are you talking about? Well, what do you mean? I have baptized in water, then I'm going to be a wet sinner. <laughs> Verse 22, you know what else they're worried about? 22, look at 22. They feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. You know what religion is worried about? They're too worried about their stature. Kick anyone out who's following Christ. Censor him like a good, religious, open-minded bigot. That's what they were. Look at verse number 26. You know what else he did? Right? 26. What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? Look at verse number 29. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. These guys don't have an ounce of spirituality. They can't figure out how the miracle happened. They don't know where the Messiah is coming from. They are clueless. And religion is clueless. Ask the average religious person. They got no clue what's going on. Verse 34. Are you hating on religion? Yeah, uh uh-huh. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm not hating them. I'm hating on that system that keeps people blind and in bondage. 934. You know what else? They were too stuck up to save anyone. They didn't care. Look what it says. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Oh, what good godly pastors to the nation of Israel. You ever read Jeremiah and Ezekiel when God levies a judgment against the pastors of his people? He's talking about that crowd who more care about, cared more about prestige and position, position and greetings in the marketplaces, right? I, it was funny. We went to go help Vinny a few weeks ago to help move him a little bit. And your mom had this funny moment. You weren't there. She goes, wait a minute. I was moving. You're the pastor. Yeah. Uh-huh. What? I, you can't get your hands dirty. You can't pick up a couch. You know, this idea, this man of God complex that people got that you can't get down. When I see the Savior, he picked the dirty stuff out of the the, the toenails of the disciples. That's what the Messiah did. Anybody that's following him should be first in line to get down on their face to help somebody else. Get in the hole first with the shovel. Don't sit there, well, I'm I'm the, what is that? That is some sick stuff. That's twisted. I mean, she didn't mean it. it surprised her, right? People get surprised. Oh, the past. We came from a church. Well, that's what the pastors did. They picked up the shovel and they got in the hole. So we just followed suit. You know what those guys were that were talking to this blind man? They were proud, cruel monsters. But they were just monsters with nice robes on. That's what religion is. It's the monster in the closet with wearing a religious garb. A man by the name of Jefferson Bethke delivered a spoken word several years ago that went viral. You could say that word viral now, right? And it's called, Why I Hate Religion But Love Jesus. Some of you might have heard it. And he hits the nail on the head in the middle of it. I can't spit as well as he did. He has a better flow. But he says, uh, religion might preach grace, but another thing they practice. Tend to ridicule God's people. They did it to John the Baptist. They can't fix their problems, and so they just mask it not realizing religions like spraying perfume on a casket. You see, the problem with religion is it never gets to the core. It's just behavior modification like a long list of chores. Like, let's dress up the outside, make it look nice and neat. But it's funny, that's what they used to do to mummies while the corpse rots underneath. I'm talking about a supernatural change. And if you want change in your life, you need Jesus to pass by. You need an encounter and a relationship with him. Notice the wording, Jesus passed by. That's his earthly title. That's the name of a man. That's the name of a God-man who took on flesh, who got his hands dirty, brother. John 9, 6. You see it right there? We're done. Hold on. Don't get nervous. I know we're a little over 12. Don't get nervous. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with with, with clay. That's the one whose mouth and hands formed the clay that touched the man's eyes with what came out of his mouth and what he did with his hands. That's what touched you, right? What came out of his mouth and how he got those hands dirty. That's what saved you. That's what's got to impress you. The one whose breath spoke 
the universe into existence and stooped to dwell among sinners. That's what the, the Messiah did. The Savior got down and played with the dirt. That's a picture of what he did with you and me. Came down and dwelt and dealt with sinners. Elitist? Not my God. Holier than thou? Not my God. Too high to access? Not my God. Maybe crazy Nancy, but not my God. My God doesn't back up on what he says. My God doesn't decree things for people and then does, has another set of rules for him. No, no, no. My God was the first one to jump down into the pit to rescue me. That's why I love him. I love him today. If I could, we'd sit here all day and just preach about him. I'm not. I'm finishing. But in verse number seven, that's the Jesus who has got to touch your life if you're to be saved and forever changed. The one who came down from heaven and got dirty. Look at verse seven. And said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. You see, Jesus did everything. He had put the dirt Put it up there, and he just gives you a command. Go wash. That's what you got to do. Jesus came down. Now it's up to you to obey his command to wash if you want to see. If you're not saved, you need to be washed in the blood of Christ if you want to see heaven one day. If you want to see joy and peace and purpose, you've got to wash in the water of God's word if you want to keep yourself clean every day since you've been saved. But you've got to wash. Jesus did the work. Now it's up to you. Go and wash, and you'll come soon. Will you do it? Brethren, the Lord is on his way to something big. Just like he was in our stories and in our accounts. He's on his way to something big, man. A kingdom that's never going to end, where he's going to rule and reign forever and ever. I mean, that's huge, right? That is a really big thing that he's got coming. But you know what? He doesn't want to pass you by. He's got his eye on you. You see verse 1? It's right there. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. Can I tell you something right now? This same Jesus sees you right now. Right now he sees you. He looks right through your facade and he sees you. He knows if you're blind. He knows if you're in the dark. And he's looking at you. And he's just looking for someone who's looking for him. He's like, I'm on my way to go do something really big. But if anybody here is willing to get help, I am, will stop in my tracks. He will. Fanny Crosby, the blind hymn writer, one time went to a jail, and she walked to into a room full of men whom society had cast aside, criminals locked away in a fortress. Crosby, speaking at this evangelistic service in a prison near her home, overheard one prisoner's desperate prayer, quote, Good Lord, do not pass me by. Don't turn your back on me. Do not ignore me. Forget me. Neglect me. Crosby went home that night and penned four verses in a chorus in a song we sing called Pass Me Not. The Lord won't pass you by, guys. The Lord won't pass you by. And I will testify, you testify with me with an amen. My life has been changed since Jesus passed by. Yeah? My life has been forever changed. I love his disciples, but his disciples didn't change me. His disciples were just figuring out, what's all of these theological questions? No, no, the one who changed me and saved me was Jesus. Don't you ever forget it, that the God who came to earth passed by you to save your soul. What a change in your life since Jesus passed by. As the blind man was sitting there by the way, he cried to Jesus for mercy that day. And Jesus commanded and gave him his sight. So he followed Jesus, and I'm sure he cried, Jesus passed by my way, and he made me whole that day. Such a sinner was I, but then Jesus passed by, and oh, what a change in my life since Jesus passed by. And just like the blind man, I wandered 
alone in the darkness of sin. I was always alone, but one day I met him and he made things right. And oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by and Jesus passed by my way and he made you whole that day. Such a sinner was I, but then Jesus passed by and oh, what a change in your life since Jesus passed by. Amen. And amen. And you know what? Jesus will not pass you by. The question is, are you prepared to pass Jesus Christ by? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Hey, folks, I know a lot of you, but I'll ask you this question. Jesus Christ is looking at you right now, whether it's your first time in church or your hundredth time in a church meeting. Are you saved? If you're not saved, can you just be honest enough before God and say, I have not trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I do not know if heaven is my home. I do not know if my sins are forgiven. But I would like to know, Pat, here is my hand. Lift it up, put it right back down. Nobody's looking around and taking names or making an oath. But just acknowledge before God, I need Jesus. I am not saved. I've never called upon the Lord to save me. Anybody like that at all? Slip your hand up, put it right back down. Jesus is passing by. Don't miss him. It isn't just church. It isn't Christianity. It's a personal one-on-one -on -one encounter with the Savior of the world. Have you had one? If you're not sure if you had one, we just want to pray for you. Anybody like that? Hey, Christian, have you gotten caught in religion? <laughs> Did you think your Bible reading by itself is what saved you? Did you think your good deeds and your street ministry and your prayer life is what really does it? Never forget, it is Jesus Christ who works through all those things, that great God and our Savior who kissed your dear soul by passing by your way. And if you're sitting there right now, let him know you're thankful. Let him know you love him. Let him know you want to build that relationship and get to know him better. Don't let him pass by, because all of eternity, you'll be in front of him. Be like those disciples who, when they saw him risen again, held him by the ankles and didn't want to let him go. Don't let him go. Father, thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for your son. Thank you that he is altogether lovely. And I pray, Lord, you'd get all the glory of everything that was said today, the singing, the preaching, the fellowship, everything that could be done from this, Lord. May you, Lord Jesus, get a smile from our lives. You deserve it, and we love you. Help us to love you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here today. Have a great week.